Hello, everybody. Welcome to stage three. All right. These next three speakers are total badasses, and they are here to talk about having some fun cracking passwords with you. There's lots to cover. I don't want to take up too much more time. There'll be a survey included in the chat. So please enjoy. And let me hand it on over to Destiny, Marissa, and Chesley. Go for it. Hello, everyone. Thank you for having us and welcome to Let's Crack Passwords. Right before we get started, we have to show our distribution statement for a few seconds, but now we can move on to our agenda. We'll be going over common mistakes people do, five steps on how you can crack passwords, attack scenarios, and password best practices. My name is Destiny Plaza. I'm a cybersecurity engineer. My name is Marissa Midler, and I'm also a cybersecurity engineer. And my name is Chesley Cribs, and I am your resident hacker. So uh, in 2018, you heard of a incoming ballistic missile threat that was sent out as a text message to Hawaii. Um, but this wasn't actually the biggest news in the InfoSec community. Actually, it was this picture. This picture was posted by the Associated Press. It was an operations manager who thought that he had everything going on, except there was a sticky note on his uh, computer telling everyone what the password was. So does this really happen in common things that people do? So yes, people do put their passwords on sticky notes. Yes, we, we really don't recommend that, but we'll talk about that later. We also do password reuse and we have identifiable information that we use as passwords. So may I present my new puppy, Lucy? And she's, she's awesome. I love her so much. I put her birthday everywhere. She goes to daycare. And you know what? I post it on Instagram. I post it on Facebook. I post it on Twitter. And even my colleagues at LinkedIn know about Lucy. But I love Lucy so much. She is my password. And people like me, hackers, they know this, they can do recon. And it's easy as one, two, three, literally, uh, to figure out what this password is. So please don't, please don't hack me. But does this really happen? As a hacker, as a pen tester, I see passwords like I love you or I love Lucy or my first name as a password so often and one of the best things that we see as attackers is we love low hanging fruit. So the last bullet on this list is admin. These are default credentials. If I can Google a password, it's game over. So what we like to recommend is something called have I been pwned. Uh, this is where you can input your uh, email. You can input your password just to see if it has been pwned or has it if it's come up in any database breaches. But again, it is up to you to secure your password and make sure that it's uncrackable or not even worth the effort to want to crack. All right, now it's time to crack. Ready, set, stop. Actually, we need to ask ourselves, do we have the proper authorization? If the answer is no, we do not want to proceed because we don't want to be affiliated with illegal activity. So make sure you have the proper permissions before you start anything. But now we'll go to our steps. Step one, Kali. What is it? It's free, open source, made for penetration testers, researchers, and curious people like us. It has over 600 tools built in and it has something to our particular interest, which is password crackers. Step two is gathering a word list. Luckily enough, Kali has this for us. You can also get them from GitHub or even generate your own. The one that we'll be using is rocku.txt. Step three is the password cracking tool itself. We'll be going over two hash base crackers, John the Ripper and Hashcat, which both support CPU and GPU. John, however, was built more towards CPU and Hashcat towards GPU usage. John also is a lot better at cracking passwords less than eight characters, whereas Hashcat more than eight characters, but both can do vice versa. Step four is to identify your target, but oh wait, stop again. We need to ask ourselves if we have the proper permission, because if we don't, we should not be identifying or locating anything to crack. And step five, start cracking. 
So we'll be going over to our example with John the Ripper. So, all right, step one was in our Cali box. We're in it, fantastic, great. Step two is to locate the word list that we're gonna use. Luckily enough, Cali has this handy command called locate word list, where it outputs all the word lists that comes pre-installed in our Cali box. As we can see here, we have a lot of word lists. Again, to our interest, however, is rocku.txt. As we can see here, if this is your first time using this, then you will have to unzip RockU. But I happen to have already done that. So we're going to go ahead and look at the first 10 contents of RockU.txt with the head command. Here we see in RockU.txt is the most common passwords. Unfortunately, we're seeing things like password, I love you, princess, and one, two, three, four, five. Goodness gracious, that's horrible. Now we'll look into how many passwords are actually in rocky.txt to give you an example. And oh my goodness, it's filled with thousands of passwords. And oh, again, they're just so ugly. I'm gonna have to get them off my screen is how ugly they are. All right, moving forward. So Kelly has this thing called applications where it's able to categorize all the different tools that come pre-installed. We can see things like reverse engineering and sniffing. And oh, look here, we see password attacks where it lists out all the password crackers that it has. And I see John. So let's take a look at John. I'm going to go and do John-H to look at the help menu. So now we can see how we can pass in arguments to John. It takes in some options and a required password file, which is important to note. Another thing to note here is that we can pass in a word list with dash dash word list. This is where our rocky.txt will come into hand. We also see that it has an equal sign so you can pass in the argument. So it's really important to note the syntax when we're going over the help menu. So the equal sign seems to be important here. Another thing to look at is the dash users. This is really neat because you're able to specify a user or multiple users. And you can also put a dash in front, meaning look at all users but the ones that I have just listed. Another option to look here is groups. It works just the same as users simply with groups. And you can also put a dash in front to invert the check. Now, one of the last options I want you to look at is dash dash format. It's really important to specify the format because specifying the format will increase crack time. And thankfully enough, John comes with a command called dash dash lish formats, where you're able to see all the formats that John can handle. So let's go ahead and throw that into John to see what we get. Sweet, we get a list of all the formats that John can handle. I see things like MySQL, MongoDB, SHA-256, and MD5. You know what, speaking of MD5, I kind of want to play with uh, John with an MD5 hash, but I actually don't have one offhand, so I wonder how I would do that. So let's go ahead and look at how hashes work. So how hashes work is that you take a plain text, throw it into a hash function, and you get a hash text, so a hash representation of your plain text. And the hash representation of your plain text should be the thing stored as passwords. Hopefully, hopefully. <laughs> so I'm gonna go ahead and try to make a dummy password and I'm going to use the MD5 hash and I'm gonna have this password called winter. So as you can see here that winter is my plain text and I passed in the MD5 sum and I got my hash representation. So I got the MD5 hash of winter. Now we're gonna have to throw this hash into a file, why? because recall that in the help menu, John required a password file. So we're gonna have to copy this hash and throw it into a file. So that's what I'm doing right here. I'm gonna copy this, then I'm gonna throw it into a file and I'm gonna call this file target.txt. Sweet, so let's go ahead and look to make sure it's in there, it's in there, awesome. Now let's test John out with our mock password file. So we're gonna do pseudo John, we're gonna put in the format, which we know is MD5, and we have to put our password file, which is target.txt. So let's go ahead and run this. We ran this and that was lightning fast. As you can see, it was able to grab the hash 
representation of our string and find out that it was the string winter, which is correct. That was our dummy password. We're doing great so far, so let's create another dummy password. And I'm also using MD5, and I'm gonna make this password say love. My password is gonna be love. And I got the hash representation of love. So let's go again and pass in that MD5 hash, and we're gonna throw it into a file. I'm simply gonna overwrite what was in target.txt. Now, let's make sure that it's in there, so I'm gonna cat this. Sweet, now I see my hash in there. But do remember that John can take in a word list. We didn't use that previously because John already has a word list pre-built in, but we can specify one. And we talked about rocku.txt. So with rocku.txt, we first need to know where it's stored. And we see that it's stored in user share word list. Now we have to take this path and put it in our word list option. So we're gonna do that by dash W colon, the path to the file, then rocku.txt. Great. So now we have our command, we have our word list, we have our format, which is MD5, and we have our password file, which is target.txt. Let's go ahead and run this. Again, super fast. It was able to grab that MD5 hash and see that the plain text is love, and that is true. That was our dummy password. So we've been doing great so far with our dummy passwords. So let's kind of spice things up a little bit. So I'm going to look at what's in my directory here. And I see I have a file called targets.txt. This is a file that I created, actually. So let's go ahead and look at it. Sweet. So see, we have three users in here. The format that John likes is for you to put a username, a colon, and a hash. And right here, I'm looking at admin. Seems interesting. I want to crack it, but how? We have to go back to our help menu to figure out how we can crack this user. So let's go ahead and do that. John dash H got my help text and I see that it's simply dash users. Great. So now I know that option. Let's go ahead and use it. So I'm going to do pseudo John, my word list targets.txt. And I'm going to use that dash users equals admin. But wait a second, it didn't run, huh? I wonder why. Well, actually, maybe it's not MD5 hash after all. That's what we've been using so far. And if you're unsure about what hash type something is, Kali has a neat tool called Hash Identifier. Well, it's able to display a prediction of what hash type something may be. So I'm gonna go ahead and copy my hash for admin. And I'm going to go ahead and run hash identifier simply by doing hash dash identifier. Now I can pass, pass in my hash by simply pasting it. And I get an output of the possible hashes and it's telling me it may be SHA-256. So maybe it was an MD5 after all, it's SHA-256. So let's go ahead and change that in our format. So our format is going to be raw dash SHA. 256. Sweet. So now we have our word list, Rocky. We have our format, which is SHA-256, our password file, and dash users equals admin. Oh, super fast again. And we see that the password for admin was simply admin. Looks like someone was using default credentials. Not good. All right, so so far we've been only cracking one thing in our password file, but you can crack more than one thing in our password file. So let's go ahead and look at the rest of the contents of target.txt. We see we have more users, so let's go ahead and just crack the rest of them. All I have to do is just pass in that file. So now I have my word list, my format, SHA-256, and my password file. So it's going to crack the remaining hashes. Let's see this work. That was pretty fast. We see that for user target one, the password was lucky777. Kind of not that lucky after all, since we cracked them. For target two, we see that the password was pizza rules. I do agree that pizza rules, but not a great password. So a key takeaway that I want you to get from John is this command right here. We have John-W, which means you pass in that word list 
dash format, which you specify the format type and then the required password file. If you happen to not know what hash you're working with, do remember that you can use hash identifier to get the hash type. We also looked at using John without a word list, with a word list, and specifying a particular user to crack. So I'm going to be talking about Hashcat. Hashcat is super robust. So we're going to take a look at the help menu first. We see and we pipe this to less. We get dash M is the hash type. It has hundreds. We're going to see dash A for attack mode. We're going to look at two today. We're going to see straight and combination. Again, just the help flag. We also see dash O for an output file. We can also see dash B for a benchmark test, which we're going to test this out with MD5. Then we always recommend that you do dash capital O for optimization, just to initialize Hashcat first. We're going to see Hashcat dash dash example hashes over here, where you're going to see the hundreds, if not thousands, of potential hashes that Hashcat can crack. Hundreds, I'm telling you. Then we're going to do a benchmark test. We're going to do the dash B option. M0 for MD5. We're going to start cracking that, not cracking, but seeing how fast my computer can actually handle MD5 cracking. So it'll give you all of the latency and all of the speeds for a specific hash type. Then we're going to create a hash of hello world. We're going to pipe that to a file and we're going to make this a SHA-256. This is going to be your example of a straight attack. So it's going to be hash Hashcat dash A with the attack mode dash M for the hash type, your hash file, and your word list. I like to use sec lists. That's just what we do. We're going to do 1400 for SHA-256. We're going to crack that password, and we see that that's hello world. It previews right on the screen for you, so you don't have to keep guessing or locating it all. But if you do want to find it, you can also find it in a hidden directory with dot hashcat in the local users um, directory in the hashcat.pot file. This will show every single hash that you've attempted to crack in the past. So you can see that hello world right there. Next, we're going to show a combination attack. This is a little bit tricky, but you see I have two word lists here. I have words one and words two with super world and secret and hello and password in another. So again, this is just a different view of it. We're just going to show the passwords files again. This is really helpful if you have a web page and you're not too sure what the password might be, but you want to combine both of them. So we're just going to print this out to standard out, words one and words two, just so you can see how Hashcat uses this. So you're going to see both of them be combined. So you can see my password is potentially in there. So we're going to do dash a one for a combination attack. This is going to be your, your syntax. It's going to be dash M for your hash type again, and then your word list one and your word list two. So again, we're going to fill this in for the command again, dash A one dash M. And we don't really know, but we've used destinies, a hint for hash ID. So we know that it's going to be an MD5 hash. So we send in that combination MD5 hash file, we're also going to send in words one, and then we're going to send in words two. It's going to start to attempt to crack. And then we see that that is right there. My password is secret password. It's not so secret, but we're also going to do the dash dash show option. This will just allow you again to see that password as the file was given to you. So just in summary, uh, it's a lot of information. So if you have questions, please feel free to ask at the end. But as a general rule, the syntax for Hashcat is going to be Hashcat A with the attack mode number. So zero through, I think, seven. Um, and then we're going to have dash M for your hash type. You can find this on the help menu for Hashcat. You're going to send in your hash file and your word list. Again, I like to use Seclist, which you can download from GitHub. It has plenty of word lists for you to try, stuff that's used for web pages, for specific web pages on the back end. Um, so that's a really good tool for you to use if you grab something somewhere else. 
We also showed dash A for the attack mode. We, we previewed straight uh, combination and more, dash M for the hash type, dash capital O to optimize your kernel. This will help speed the process up. Um, and then dash B for benchmark mode, for giving a specific hash type and seeing those speeds. Okay, and now on to the damn vulnerable web application scenario. So welcome to the damn vulnerable web application. Um, this is a free and open source project you can find on GitHub. So um, we're using this application to show you a contextual SQL injection attack today. Um, but like I said, this can be used for other things. And this will provide a legal environment for you to try new tools or try new attack tactics. Um, but mostly we want to stress that this will give you a legal environment to do these things. We don't want you guys doing any illegal activity. Uh, so you can get this in GitHub, throw it on a virtual machine and get to it. So how do we log in to this application? We can try some default credentials. So let's try admin and password. And that worked. So as you see, it's admin and password. Um, so don't use default credentials because that's what we guess first. Uh, then we go down to the security um, settings and we change it from high to low to make this application vulnerable to our SQL injection attack. Um, you can see a change up there for low and down at the bottom. Sometimes it can get a little bit wacky. Um, so just check and make sure that it's on the correct security level that you want it to be on. So we're now at the SQL injection page. And how do we approach this? So we can first try to see what the user input will give us back. And we're just trying out one. And we see that it returns an ID, a first name, and a surname. Um, so we can check on seeing this input validation. And it also is giving it to the backend application in the URL. So we know it's going with the ID variable. So we're going to try and see if they're doing input sanitization on the back end. And basically, that's if they're checking that we're just putting in valid uh, information that they would expect. But they are not. So basically, what we put in is we're looking for either when the ID equals 1337 or when 0 equals 0. And since zero equals zero is always true, it's returning all the rows in the database for us. So since we know um, this, we're gonna actually go into and explain a little bit about the SQL injection. Since this is an open source application, we can actually see the SQL query that is running on the DBWA. Um, and we are looking at this ID variable because that is where our user input is actually going. Um, the 1337 or 0 equals 0 is going to ID. So whenever it actually processes, it's going to enter this valid SQL query for us, which is what, what gets returned, um, which is the query we use for all that information to get returned. Going forward, though, um, we're actually going to try to use some of the MySQL functions. Um, right now, we're going to use the version function and basically try to see what version of MySQL this uh, application is running. And once we hit enter, um, it actually will generate for us. And this is running 5.1.41. We're basically just using this as more um, enumeration and recon just so we know what we're actually poking at. Um, we can use the user function to find out what user is actually running on this on the back end of this MySQL database. And um, we're doing this as a manual exercise just to give you context information of where attackers might be finding these password hashes. So we're using root at localhost on this MySQL database. So this is um, kind of more uh, important, and we're going to find some more information about this MySQL database with the information schema.tables. And these SQL queries were carefully crafted. Um, you probably would go through a bunch of trial and error while you're running them. But there are also um, security tools like SQL Map um, that will automate this process. But this is returning all the tables in the database. Um, using that information schema.tables query. And we're interested in password hashes. So we're going to look for a users table. And there is a users table. So since we know there's a users table, we can use this information for our next SQL query. 
So we're going to enter in um, 1337 and 0 equals 0, you can select null, concat 0x0a, which is the hexadecimal um, new line character, just to format our information a little bit better. And then we're going to use the table name and column name. So basically what this is doing is grabbing all the column names from the users, ta the table users. Um, which is important because then we'll know what information is stored on that uh, MySQL database table. So our column names are user ID, first name, last name, user, and password. And realistically, we're really interested in those user and password columns. So our next SQL query will be calling for the user and password columns. And um, basically, if everything goes as planned, we should have a nice list of usernames and password hashes. That hash at the end is just a comment um, character for SQL, which makes it ignore everything else after our query. So the username is admin, and there's the password hash. Um, since there's only five of them, we would just copy and paste that. Um, you might write a script if there's a lot more, because um, copy and pasting can get tedious. Uh, but conveniently, we already have all the passwords, the username and password hashes in a file in the username colon password hash format, because that is what John the Ripper likes. So our next step is we are going to use John and try to crack these password hashes. And we've already seen um, 32 character hashes and they kind of look like MD5. So we kind of have an inkling that these might be MD5 hashes. First, we got to change into our directory. And now we can start um, looking for MD5. But if you don't remember the format, because why wouldn't you? Why would you? Like, you can just grep it. Um, it's just a nice little cheap sheet way of trying to find um, the formatting. So we're going to be using raw attack MD5. And basically, our format is going to be raw attack MD5. We're going to use the raw queue word list. So we're going to do tac tac word list, user share word list raw queue.txt. And then we're going to run it on our password hash file, dbwa hashes.txt. And this is going to run in like zero seconds. So we will see what happens. OK. And like I said, it took no time at all to crack these passwords. So there's five password hashes, but why there's only four? And that's actually because Smithy and Admin are using the same password. And um, you can see their password hashes are identical. So if you want to see every cracked password, we can use the tac tac show command and show that. And there are our five cracked password hashes. And as you see, Smithy and Admin both use the password password, which is terrible. Don't use that. So now we're going to try it with Hashcat. So we can do the same thing um, in grep for MD5. <clears throat> if you haven't used Hashcat before, if you do the tech H, it's great. But it's like 30 pages of information, and it's really hard to scroll through. So this is just kind of a way to cut down on that a little bit. <clears throat> So we saw that MD5 is tac m0. So we're going to um, write out hash cat tac m0 for MD5. We need to use the tac tac username command since our password hash file has username names within it. Um, and then we're going to pass in our password hash file itself, dbwa hashes.txt, and then the um, file path to our word list. And this runs in no time at all as well. And as you see here, that Hashcat also doesn't print out um, duplicate password hashes. So if we want to see all five password hashes, we have to do that tac tac show. And they do a little bit format, different format. It's username, password hash, and then um, you still get their cracked password. But like I said, this um, the SQL injection part of this was just for context. Um, 
hope like if you're interested in more SQL injection, try this stuff out for yourself on BBWA. But we logged into the application with default credentials. Um, they were admin and password. We performed a manual SQL injection on DBWA. You can try a bunch of different tactics on that if you are interested. Uh, we cracked the password hashes collected from the vulnerable MySQL database, and then we ran them with John the Ripper and Hashcat using those two commands. And uh, this is actually for Chislea. <laughs> no worries. So I wanted to present something that would make sense in a real world scenario. So these are things that you might happen to come upon uh, as a penetration tester, or as, a, as a hacker in the real world. So these are attack paths to get you two hashes. So for example, we want to get a SHA-1 hash, um, and this is our end goal. So the potential attack path could be that we run some reconnaissance. We see that there's ports and services running on um, 135, 8500, and 49154. Those were kind of obscure, so not too much information could be gathered, but we visit the URL running on 8500, um, and we see that there we can enumerate through these directories with no restricted access. This is our favorite thing because we like to break into things, and if we don't have to break anything, this is most helpful. Um, but we see that it takes us to an administrative panel on a CMS. So we can see that the CMS has a known vulnerability that can traverse these directories in the admin panel to give us a password properties file. So once we do this, we can preview all of the passwords to the machine for me, an attacker. So it looks like these are hash. I'm not too sure what to do with these, but Marissa is going to show you. All right, so Cheslia conveniently got us these password hashes, and there's quite a few of them. There's actually exactly 1,000. Um, we are going to, we don't know what hashes these are, so we're actually going to use hash ID, um, kind of like what Destiny did in the beginning. Um, with hash ID, you can also pass in a file, and um, then you can also use TACJ to give the format for John the Ripper. So basically, hash ID will attempt to um, identify every hash. We're not going to scroll through all 1,000 of these, but you can kind of see that there are quite a few hashes in here. And it's saying that it might be John the Ripper, um, SHA-1. So we're going to use raw TAC SHA-1 and run that on John the Ripper on this ha password hash file. So that's gonna be tac tac format equals raw tac sha one. And then we're gonna use our Rocky word list. And that's gonna be at user share word list rocky.txt. And then we pass in our um, password hash file. And it chewed through those 1000s like it was password hashes like it was nothing. Um, this was actually the top most common one, um, 1,000 passwords we got, excuse me, we grabbed that off GitHub. And um, there are some colorful language in there, so we apologize, but um, blame people and their vulnerable passwords. Uh, so we're gonna try this with Hashcat now. So we all know what the mode for Hashcat is either. So we're gonna use hash ID again, and then tack M. So it's saying we know they're SHA-1, so we're going to look at the hashcat mode 100. And that is what we're going to use in our next hashcat command. So it's going to be hashcat tack m, and then we're going to put in our, our tack m100, excuse me. Then we're going to put in our password hash file and then our word list. This one takes like 0.2 milliseconds longer, but it still was pretty quick. Um, and if we wanna see all the passwords cracked again, we can use that tack tack show. So hashcat actually doesn't give you like the number of ha hashes that were cracked. So we're just gonna pipe that into um, a word count and get the number and it was 987, which is expected because we use the same word list and um, password hash file as we did on John the Ripper. But basically in this scenario, we collected the password hashes from a vulnerable content management services. Um, we used hash ID to identify the SHA-1 hash. 
And then we cracked the SHA-1 password hashes with John the Ripper and Hashcat using the Rocky word list and the raw tag SHA-1 format and the mode 100 for Hashcat. So I'm also wanting to show a Windows exploitation path because Windows is notorious for being the worst. Um, so we're going to run reconnaissance. We've gotten a machine uh, that we think is running Windows. So we, we run this Nmap scan. We see 5388, 135, 139, 389, 445. These are notorious for Windows services. And they're things like the domain, Kerberos, LDAP, um, and all of that. So we can specifically identify that this machine is going to be a Windows machine. We see that since SMB is open, we can go and check out the shares. We have anonymous login access, which again is perfect for us because I like easy access. I don't like to work too hard. Um, so. I'm going to go in and check through all of these directories or the shares. And so we're going to enumerate them with a num for Linux. This is also a tool that's found on Kali. Um, please explore it if you need to. Um, but we've gained access to what I would like to say is a domain controller, which is the highest privilege or the highest crown jewel that you want to get in a Windows network. So we're going to try to find this juicy information. We're going to use a Python script called Get MP Users. It's a script that harvests all of the non-pre-authenticated as rep uh, responses from users in a specific domain. So this is a form of like Kerberos scene if you're familiar. But again, it's non-pre-authenticated. Non so this output is going to be given to us for a service account. And from here, I'm going to crack this password for you. So here on my screen, you see this hash. It's Kerberos 5 as rep. It's a super long hash, um, but we can deal with it. Not too bad. Um, on the left hand of my screen, you see Hashcat. You see on the right hand side, John. So we're going to show them side by side to see the differences for one particular hash. We're going to use dash M18200 for a Kerberos as rep hash. We're going to use dash dash format. Curb, curb 5 as rep. We're going to send in that file, which is called curb 5. I like, again, to use secklist, so I'm going to send it rock you. You can send whatever password, uh, word list you want. I'm going to start hashcat, then I'm going to start john, and quite surely you're going to see this uh, password being cracked nearly immediately. You see here the hashcat, since it started first, already cracked. John just finished. But you see this password is s three R V I C E while it does have a number in it, still not as secure as you want, but I'm going to show it to the screen so that you can see it using the dash dash show sending in again, that mode for hashcat and the file that we used. So you can see that right to the screen. So hashcat will show it as the full hash. And then John will show it as the user with the domain and the password. So again, just in summary, this is a lot of information. If you're not too technical or you're not too familiar with how Windows processes work or Windows services work, not to worry. Um, but we did enumerate a domain controller for information on the users within that specific domain. We grabbed one ASRAP hash from a Python script called getnpusers.py. This can be found on GitHub. Um, but you ran both John and Hashcat to return the password for a ticket granting service for Kerberos on the domain controller with the cracked password of S3RVICE. Again, the syntax for the commands are right below. So if you need any hints on how to use this or use this in your own version of labs, you can. So we've been focusing a lot on John the Ripper and Hashcat, but it's important to mention that there are additional password crackers out there. There are password crackers that use rainbow tables, which are um, pre-cracked passwords. So if you have your hash and these rainbow tables contain that hash, you can just 
um, compare the hash to the rainbow table and get the password. And there's CrackStation, which is a web-based one, and then Rainbow Crack and Oomph Crack you can um, put on most operating systems. There's Windows-specific um, password, password crackers, and that is Kane Enable and Brutus. So if you're operating primarily off a Windows machine, um, Kane Enable is known to being a very robust password cracker. There's also Wi-Fi um, password crackers, and AirCrack um, and G can crack vulnerable Wi-Fi protocols. And also there's Hydra and Medusa, which were built for, primarily for brute forcing. So if you're looking for good password crackers to brute force some passwords, they might be what you want to use. All right, so now that we know how fast it is to crack passwords, now let's protect ourselves with these password best practices. So research shows that passphrases are a lot better than short and complex passwords for two reasons. They're hard to crack, and it's actually a lot easier for us to remember. An example of a passphrase is something like, I eat kale, ice cream, potatoes. Strange combination, I know, but it works. We can remember it. Again, do note, however, that you must insert different characters, such as numbers, special characters, and mess with ca casing to increase the strength of your password. But since passphrases are so easy for us to remember, it allows us to have longer passwords because length matters. The longer our password is, the longer it takes for it to crack. If you're still unsure about the length, the strength of your password, sorry, you can hop up over to howsecuresmypassword.net as an example of a password strength meter where you input your password and it outputs a prediction of how long it will take to crack. Now, our last point here is do not reuse passwords. We could not have stressed this enough at the very beginning of the presentation. It's essential that you don't do this. An example of this is that, for example, I have two accounts, my Spotify and my bank account, which happens to use the same email address. And I happen to have reused my password for both as well. A bad actor is able to hack into my Spotify account, but now also have the credentials to log into my bank account. Things are not looking good for me at all. Another example of password reuse is actually default credentials. I get a router and it comes with a seemingly complex password, but actually it's easily searchable online and keeping it results to a high probability of me getting cracked. Now, I know we've talked so much information about passwords and these practices may seem a little bit daunting, but we actually do have a solution for you. So with that, the introduction of password managers, I know in the beginning of the, the talk, someone had mentioned Lockwise. So this is a built-in one in Firefox, but we also wanna introduce uh, password managers that allow you to create strong and unique passwords for every single website. And then you can auto generate secure passwords. They can auto fill your credentials, like your emails, like your addresses, your phone numbers. So you don't have to do that every single time and waste time. Again, I'm pretty lazy, so helps me. Um, and also can prevent password spraying. So like Destiny mentioned, I would like to grab a breach uh, from GitHub or anything from the source of dark net, dark web, and I just spray all of those passwords for every single uh, email address that I can find. So that would really help having a password manager. So this is just an example of what you can see from a password manager. If you've never actually used one, you can generate the password, you can make it random, you can make it zero to probably 36 or so characters. I've chosen one that's 24 characters using symbols and numbers. And then from there, you can see that it'll autofill those passwords for you whenever you visit the web page. There's also addition, pa additional password manager features. Um, most are cross-platform, so you can basically use them on your mobile devices, your tablets, your desktop computers, and also browsers. Um, so it's just pretty convenient to be able to use it against all your different devices. Uh, most password managers on are with a freemium business model. So there's free, they usually have a free version, but the security extras usually are included in the paid versions. There are cloud-based and locally hosted password managers. So that kind of depends on your risk posture and um, your basic use, your use case. So mostly cloud-based, um, most users would probably opt for that just based off of convenience, um, the locally hosted one, if you 
just need to host it yourself and you don't want it to the cloud, then that might be for you. Uh, the, below here are just some basic password managers that are out there. One password, Bitwarden, Dashlane, Keeper, LastPass, and NordPass. Um, just check them out, see what works for you. And ultimately, what we want you to take away from the stock is to protect yourself. Don't reuse passwords. Um, utilize password managers. Use the use passphrases. And generally, the more characters, the better. Think like an attacker. Um, if your password is easy to brute force or guess, then um, the attacker is probably going to get it. If it takes a long time, they might pass pass over you onto someone who is more vulnerable. And if you want to try password cracking for yourself, um, make sure you have authorization and use platforms that are legal. We can't stress this enough. We just don't want you getting into any trouble or doing anything illegal. Any questions? This, this was excellent. There was a lot of interest from the uh, attendees. I noticed that uh, you were really good at, at jumping in and sharing. I think one of the questions was, uh, does John take into account more of passphrase? Um, I would say that it kind of depends on the word list that you use. Um, for John and Hashcat, um, if you're trying to crack passphrases, like there are, I'm sure there's word lists out there that do look into trying to crack more passphrases than the most common passwords. Okay, and I think we have uh, time for uh, another one. There was a, an interesting question here about, do you have a recommendation over and above or preference with regard to the uh, the password managers that you've listed? Um, so we actually cannot um, kind of give you a, a recommendation for password managers, um, mm -hmm. unfortunately. I will say that there's a lot of good ones out there and um, like you could even go into uh, the security Twitter sphere. I know that was a topic of conversation a couple weeks ago. Um, mm -hmm. So. I would just probably crowdsource that one. We unfortunately cannot give you a recommendation. That's great, much appreciation. And also uh, there was a lot of interest in the talk being recorded, but is also, are the slides, will, will those be available? Oh, and we'll if, have to get back to you on that no one actually, worry. just to double check on our side, sorry. <laughs> okay, and will they be able to, they can follow somebody, some of you on Twitter? to uh, keep themselves safe and learn more about password cracking? Yeah, sure, or on LinkedIn too. I think it's on our platform okay. hopping account, yeah. All right, that's awesome. I'm, I'm gonna wrap it up here. I wanna thank you all so very much for what you shared here today. And I hope you have a terrific time through the rest of our conference. And I encourage all of our attendees to please go and visit some of the other uh, great villages and events that we have on today, our career village, for example, or go see our sponsors at the uh, Expo Village. And other than that, thank you very, very much.